honor students at the University of South Africa, UNISA, to this training to prepare you for the upcoming assessments to orientate you a little bit about the learning management system, more specifically some of the tools that I use, including the plagiarism software. And we also have with us uh, Ms. Uh, Milan, who will share with us a little bit about what the library offers. Uh, so I hope you got, uh, you know, it's a Friday evening, so I'm sure you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the session with us. Let me introduce you to the team that we have with us today. I have uh, Mr. David Alperstad, who is a digital learning advisor from Polokwani and also a member of the Academic Development Open Virtual Hub. He's an education technologist. I have Mr. Richard Wright, who is from uh, Cape Town, the Cape Town office. He's also a digital learning advisor and an educational technologist in the Academic Development Open Virtual Hub. And then we have uh, Dr. Ingrid Murray, who is from the Center for Professional Development, and she's also a member of the Academic Development Open Virtual Hub. And then it's our pleasure, as I mentioned earlier, to have with us Ms. Uh, Melanie Milan from the library, and she will show, show with us some key tools and insights. And I think this is going to be very beneficial for you in terms of understanding what are the services offered by the library and some of the interesting tools. So as you will see from the program, we have quite an interesting packed program for you. And the idea behind this orientation session is really to prepare you as honor students for the upcoming uh, assessments that you have, but to make your journey at UNISA a bit more easier. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of the session is you will get access to the key platform where a lot of the training in terms of digital skills are also hosted. And I'm hoping that today that you will be able to take, benefit, take, uh, take much benefit uh, in terms of utilizing uh, these resources. With that said and done, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Richard Wright, who will lead us through the day as the program coordinator. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Denzel. Good afternoon, everyone. As Denzel mentioned, my name is Richard Wright. I'm actually from the Western Cape, a digital learning advisor, but currently seconded as a uh, educational technologist with the ADOVH. So I will be guide taking you through this session. But just before we start, so the session will follow or we'll focus more on the technology technology aspect of things. So unfortunately, we don't have any members to help with any student admin related matters such as, you know, your registrations or, uh, you know, finances. Uh, please refer to the inquiries page on MyUNISA uh, for the correct contact information. Now in the chat, we have posted a pre-course assessment. Please complete the pre-course assessment. At the end, we will uh, post a post course assessment as well. And that just really helps us with what are the areas that you perhaps uh, need some more understanding in? Where did you gain the knowledge through the session? Uh, so that we know uh, at the end where areas that we perhaps have to focus on more in future sessions. Now, firstly, very importantly, I'm going to post a link in the chat as well. Please open up the course on your side as well. This is where we will be working through most of this session. So I'll show you as well now uh, when you open up this link, uh, what you will see. So this will open up the My Modules uh, basic course. As you will see, this is on a different learning management system. This is on adovh.unisa.ac.za. Now, I really want you to be able to access this platform because there's a lot of other resources available on here as well that can really uh, benefit you. A big one would be, for instance, the Microsoft 365. A lot of you might be new to the institution. This will be the first time to introduce to uh, these technologies from Microsoft. So if you want to have a quick introduction of you know, how to use Teams effectively, how to use the uh, uh, the Microsoft Office licenses that come with your registration. Uh, this is really a good course to get started, but we will touch on this one a bit later as well. Then there's also the courses, for instance, the basic skills and presentations. A lot of modules now require you to perhaps do a presentation at the end of the year, and this really helps you go through all the steps of preparing a very good academic presentation. And then for those that are going to higher up levels, you know, for dissertation writing, there's the advanced skills Microsoft Word that takes you through all the steps of actually 
uh, writing a dissertation and using the correct tools to make your life a lot easier, such as, you know, the uh, automatic content page and, uh, you know, a list of tables and figures, all of that you will learn in there. If everything is still very new to you, I would suggest starting with the basic skills in Microsoft Word Online, uh, where you actually learn how to do a, a assignment in Microsoft Word using the online version, and then also sharing that document and downloading it as a PDF for submission. So this course platform has got a lot of resources on there. The ones that we will be focusing on tonight will be mostly on basic skills in using uh, my modules on my UNISA. So the link is in the chat uh, and it will be, uh, so please open it up on your side. I see there's a, quite a few questions regarding the recording. The recording will be uh, um, made available and the place where we will actually make this available will be on this, uh, on the ADOBH platform under recordings. So if you go to this page, if you open up the link, on the left hand navigation, there are webinar recordings and we will upload this recording under webinar recordings. So we will share that link with you afterwards as well. So just for everybody that's brand new to Nisa, we're just gonna go through a few steps. A lot of this you should have done already and that would be claiming your MyUNISA account. Um, but just to give you an overview, what are these platforms that we talk about when we talk about MyUNISA and My Life, for instance? So, MyUNISA is the official student portal. So, this is basically after registration, this is where everything happens for you as a student. So, this contains the sub portals, My Modules, where you get all your course information, and you also have access to the portal, My Admin, where you can do any administrative tasks. Now, the other one that we talk about is My Life, and that is your official UNISA email account. And that's where we, you will get all the official communications from UNISA. And you should always use this as well when communicating with your lecturer. Uh, academics and staff are advised not to respond to any emails other than My Life uh, emails. And that is because of the Poppy Act and to help to protect your information. So once you claim your UNISA, you will automatically get your My Life uh, account activated. It can sometimes take up to 24 hours, uh, but then you will have access uh, to your uh, My Life and then be able to log into my modules. Now, just a note on uh, My Life. So the My Life is actually a Microsoft 365 account, and we will have a look later at all the apps that actually becomes available when you activate or access your My Life email account. So just a quick note. So to access my UNISA, the easiest way is from the UNISA main homepage. Click on the My UNISA icon. So this will open up the My UNISA portal, and this have all the you know access to a lot of student support resources, for instance, in the region, the latest news and events, and also quick access to the library. Now, to log in for the first time, you will need to claim your UNISA login. So just a few tips when you do this, you know, you, uh, the student number that you insert is usually your reference number as well that you use through applications. You insert all the information as you did with your registration. So, for instance, if you've got multiple first names, put it in the same order as what you inserted uh, uh, as per your registration. Then it's basically your date of birth and then your identity or password uh, number. Now, you have to acknowledge all the, uh, how can I say, all the um, boxes at the end uh, to just to make sure that you understand the guidelines. Now, and then you will be provided with your password. Now keep this password very safe. This is the same password that will be used for your My Modules and uh, um, My Life account. And now even if you go log into say a workstation at a computer lab 
or library, just always make sure you're logged out so that nobody can get access to your account. Uh, because people do try and break into especially UNISA accounts. So from there, once you've got your login details, your My Life account has been activated, you can log into my modules. So remember, there is a few options at the top. The one would be log into SPL, uh, uh, log into my modules, and log into my admin. For you as a UNISA student, the, you will use this uh, second one, log into my modules. The first one is for short learning programs, not for the uh, um, degree for degree purposes. And then the last one is to log into my admin. But we will have a look at the My Admin portal as well. Now, when you log in, it will be exactly the same as per the ADOBH portal. If you want to participate in the activities, we will go through the steps of how you log in when we do some of the activities. But you click on the UNISA staff marker email address. And then you follow the steps to sign in with your My Life email account. So it will be your student number at mylife.unisa.ac.za. Uh, you type in your password that you received. Um, if it's your own device, you can always uh, select, you know, stay signed in. And just make sure of your caps locks, uh, especially when you type in your password. And especially if you get your, a new password, usually it follows a pattern of three lowercase numbers, two uh, or three lowercase characters, two numbers, and then three uppercase characters. So just make sure, you know, sometimes an uh, O might look like a zero. Uh, so just, uh, you know, play around with them if you are struggling with your password that you received. Now, <clears throat> with uh, this year, they actually released two-factor authentication. So make sure that your mobile phone number is updated on uh, my admin. Um, the basically, when you want to log in, it will ask you, it will send you a PIN. But also another way, especially if you're going to be traveling overseas, remember you won't be able to get those notifications uh, if you perhaps in a different country. So a good way is to download the Authenticator app. So you can do that for, for the Google Play Store and for the uh, Apple iOS Store. So download the app. You set it up one time so every time you want to log in you just basically come in and get a code type it in and it only requires you know internet access so if you travel perhaps overseas uh, you can still access these codes where you might not have cell phone signal or regular calls or sms's now just the last uh, one on this one uh, when you claim your or if you forget your password you can do it through um, Microsoft as well, uh, but the other way is if you struggle with your Microsoft account is to follow the steps under forgotten, you need a password. So it will be more or less the same steps that you follow, but this uh, new password will be SMS to you. Now, as we mentioned earlier, once you log into my UNISA or my modules, then you will have access to two sub portals, my modules and my admin. So remember, my modules is where all your modules are listed. You access your study material, um, you can submit your assignments, everything happens under my modules. While my admin is more for administrative purposes. Um, so if we have a look, for instance, under my admin, yeah, that's just where you can access your academic record. You can update your biographical details. You can change your password, edit your registration if it's still within the student registration period. Uh, you can also get to things like your exam results and timetables, and also view the final results on your assignments. Now, I want to really emphasize this one: the assignments results on um, my admin versus my modules. If you go to my modules, you might see an option there for grades, but those are the grades before they have been reviewed. So always refer to the my admin assignment results to see the final results you got for your portfolios and assignments and everything that you have done during the year. Now, on my admin, 
there is also the option to change your password. Now, I just want you to be very careful when you use this tool. So if you log into my admin, you go to password, uh, then you, you can type in your old password and type in a new password and then click submit. Uh, this the message just pops up at the top, a green box to say that it has changed. But sometimes it does take a few seconds. So if you go and you click submit, and then it takes perhaps a bit longer, you click submit button again, then it will actually go past this green tick that you get that you've changed your password, and you will get with a message to say incorrect password or password not in, uh, entered. And then you now try and you again try and insert your old password, and then it says it's incorrect password. So just be careful when you do use this tool to change your password. Remember just to click the submit button once. Now, just before uh, we go to the next topic, I just want to quickly step you through all this what we've done. So remember, you can go from my or oh, from Unisa to my Unisa. Your first thing that you can do is claim your Unisa login if you have not done it. You can also uh, retrieve a forgotten Unisa password. Once you log into my modules, this is where you all the learning activity takes place. And everything falls under my modules, and this is where you will have access to all your various courses. Under my admin, when you log in here, uh, you have to use your student number and your my Unisa password. So this one. It's a little bit confusing. They're still going to update this, but on the one you use your complete My Life email address. On this one, you only use your student number and your password. That's why it's taking so long. There we go. And as we said, under uh, uh, My Admin is where you can access your academic record, biographical details. You know, study material, parcel tracking is the, if they are still receiving any physical copies. Assessment admin, especially your assignment information, examination results and timetables. Um, then you can also, as we mentioned, change your password on here. So just have a look through my admin. Make sure especially that your biographical details are updated and also that your cell phone is updated your cell phone number is if you're going to change your cell phone number. Now I'm going to hand over uh, back to Denzel just to for the next topic on turn it in for by Ingrid. Thanks, Denzel. Thanks very much, Richard. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will see the value of these resources that Richard has also. Uh, captured and I'm hoping that by now you have the details. Richard did post it on the chat, if I recall correct, Richard. You did post the link on the chat as well. Um, yes. And so please, even while you are on the session, maybe try clicking on that link and accessing some of those resources. If you do have a challenge, you can quickly post on the chat and we will be able to assist you. And now, one of the critical elements with the university, we noticed that a lot of students have this challenge is to understand what, what exactly is Turnitin, why is it necessary, and uh, what is benefit for you? Uh, and much of this discussion also leads to the question of academic integrity. And it is our pleasure at this time to invite uh, Dr. Ingrid Murray, uh, who is going to unpack this for us. She has much experience in, in, in the space of uh, academic integrity over the past couple of years, and she has been researching NDVM, so she's going to provide us with some key information as well as unpack a little bit about the tool itself for us, the platform. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I know you have some family commitments as well, but we really appreciate you taking the time and uh, joining us this evening. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and just a quick wave from my side. Let me switch off my camera. So turn it in. Um, I'm sure you have all heard it. You might um, have used it before. And some of you are probably wondering, what is it? How do I use it? Um, and what does it all mean for me? So before I start telling you about the technicalities of turn it in, I'd like to ask you all, why are you doing this degree? Um, what What is making you study? Um, uh, you're all over 18, so the government is not making you do it. Um, if you could 
type in the chat maybe why why are you doing this honors degree that you are doing honors is a lot of fun um, but it is also hard work and just to share i have a nephew who's also currently doing his honors so i hear all about the pain about uh, honors degrees and how much work it is so if you could maybe um, share in the chat why you are doing doing your your honors degree. So I see Nonala is saying to add to the body of knowledge, career advancement, um, development, self development. These are all very very good reasons. Better skill advance my career, um, reach your dream career, better job opportunities. Um, to improve my knowledge of my subject. So I. I these broadly two reasons, and we can see it here in the chat, um, why people do honors degrees, advanced degrees. The one is because they they want to learn more, they want to deepen their knowledge about a certain subject, or they're very passionate about it. And the second one is to to get certified. They'd like to um, get certification for a better career. They want to go to employers and say, look. I, I I can do these skills that makes me a slightly better person than 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 uh, another person. So um, and the reason why I'm asking you why are you starting with why are you studying this degree is cheating by plagiarizing, cheating by asking other people to do your work, cheating by copying um, or uh, you know, working in a group when it's not allowed. All of those are whether you're studying because you have a passion for it and you want to learn more or whether you want a certification. If you cheat, then you are hurting only yourself. So if you if you if you cheat um, and you have a passion for this degree that you've registered for, you've cheated yourself. You're not learning, even though that is what you wanted to learn. If you're doing your degree to get certified, well, um, if an employer think that they can't trust UNISA degrees because um, you came and you said you had X or Y skill and then they actually find out that you didn't because you paid somebody else to do your work, people are going to start, employers are going to start distrusting UNISA degrees and they will stop hiring um, UNISA graduates, which if you're here because you want career development, is shooting yourself in the foot. So it's really important that whether you're studying it because you have an end goal of a better career or whether you're studying for this honors degree because you just love the subject that you're in, learn, do your own work, don't plagiarize so that you can walk away and say, look, I'm so proud of this degree that I've gotten. Um, and and that everyone knows that a UNISA graduate is special. They can work and um, they are self-driven and they have the skills that the that the certificate says that they have. So uh, that's why I wanted to start there because nothing else matters apart from those that those things. So what is Turnitin? So Turnitin is an origina originality checking service used by UNISA uh, and many other universities. It's a worldwide um, that is there to prevent plagiarism um, and to encourage academic integrity. So it's a tool that we use to say, hey, um, we up, up to a certain extent believe that the person that wrote uh, this essay, this dissertation, this research report, um, this is their own work. They didn't copy and paste it from somewhere else. So um, what Turnitin does is it finds, um, uh, it doesn't find plagiarism. It finds similarities between documents. So it goes and it looks at the document that you submitted and the documents that they have access to. And they have access to many, many, many millions of documents, both on the World Wide Web, from other universities, other students' works. And they go, you wrote this beautiful paragraph about macroeconomic theory. Is this your own paragraph or has somebody else submitted a paragraph that is the same? Did you copy that paragraph from somewhere else? Did, do you and another student have the same paragraph? So it looks for similarities. Um, and 
so when you're thinking about Turnitin, don't think about, oh, it's checking to, um, plagiarism. It checks for similarities, and similarity is an indication of plagiarism quite often. <clears throat> so I'm now going to talk really about the, um, the, the actual process that you um, going to go through. Um, so before you submit any module, uh, any assessment for any module, you need your lecturer will tell you if it is a um, uh, if Turnitin will be used, or you will go onto the, the 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 assessment page and you will see Turnitin is going to be used. So what must you do? Well, very simply, you must um, prepare work that is your own. Um, it is work that you have done uh, when you are permitted to work together. You have worked together and that's perfectly fine. That's still your own work. Um, but it, at the essence, that's what it is about. Did you do the work or did you copy and paste the work from somewhere else? Uh, when you're preparing your work, you need to acknowledge your sources, ideas, pictures, quotes, um, and you need to properly use quotation marks when you are quoting directly. So quotation marks is those two little air quotes that hangs around. And you need to properly in-text reference plus have a reference list. Remember, referencing has two parts. There's an in-text reference and there is a reference list. Um, and if you don't have both parts, um, then you have not properly referenced. Now, the, the important thing that you need to do is if you are not 100% sure how to reference for your module, you can go on to LibGuides um, and they, can, uh, they will have, for each department, they will have the proper way that you can reference. Or you can just type into Google and say ref Harvard Referencing Systems um, and, uh, you know, there you go. It will tell you exactly how to do it. But you are honest students. This is not the first time that you've had to reference. So um, do make sure that it is um, that that you reference um, properly. Then you have to have a front page and that front page uh, for your assessment, even though it is a typed assessment, you have to have a front page with your name, your student number and the module code as well as the assessment number. That is because if um, there is um, any disputes, then you can show, but look, this is the assessment that I handed in. Here's all of my information. So you must hand in your assessments with that included. That is your little stamp that, that is, this is my work. If it is a turn it in reference, you uh, turn it in assignment, your work must be typed. Um, Turnitin uh, works on typed work um, and for assignments, in any case at honours levels, you definitely must be typing your work for, assign, for assessments and for exams. Uh, during exam period, your, uh, if you didn't type in, um, type your work and handed it in and it's a Turnitin assignment, you, you will be receiving zero because the exam um, rule states that a Turnitin assessment must be typed and it must be saved as a PDF unless your lecturer has specified otherwise. So um, if you will find, um, if you have, that's the first day, the first step that you have to do. Now, um, before we get to how do you submit it through Turnitin, I just want to talk a little bit um, about two things, and that is due dates and turn it in. Your assignment will have a due date. Um, let's say your assignment is due on the 10th of April. That is the due date. Um, when you submit your assignment, um, it takes up to 48 hours to generate a turn it in report. If you have not um, uh, submitted it before that 48 hours, you will not see your Turnitin report before the deadline. And that's up to you. That's not a lecturer's mistake. If you didn't hand, submit it before those 48 hours, you will not get your Turnitin report and you can take no corrective measures if some similarity has been um, identified. 
And during the uh, and you can resubmit up to three times. The third uh, submission for Turnitin is final. And again, remember, each submission can take up to 48 hours. So if you didn't see your Turnitin report because you submitted at uh, 10 to midnight for a midnight deadline, um, then uh, two days later you go back and you see a Turnitin report that has flagged you uh, 20%. Um, too bad, so sad. Um, you have to um, leave enough time. But during the exams, you will not receive a Turnitin report. So exams and summative uh, formative assessments are slightly different. So exams and assessments are treated slightly differently. So <clears throat> uh, when, so how does it work? How are you submitting your Turnitin, uh, your assignment via Turnitin? So um, you're going to go to my modules, you go to the specific module and the specific uh, um, assessment. If this is the very first time that you are handing in a, uh, a, a Turnitin assessment, you will have to accept what they call the end user license agreement, the EULA, and I'll show you what it looks like next. Um, and but once you've submitted it, once you've accepted the EULA, the end user uh, license agreement, you don't have to um, accept it again. It's a once off process. So if you've already handed in something via Turnitin previously, um, if you have, um, uh, you know, if you used it previously, uh, there will be no problem. You will have to do nothing. Um, if this is your first time, this is a one time step. You don't have to do it again. And then you basically submit the assignment as you would normally do. So um, I think Richard or David will show you how you submit an ass assessment. Um, and that's the process you follow. There's no other website to go to. There's nothing else that you have to do, except the only thing that you have to do is click on this, I accept the Turnitin EULA, the end user license agreement. Uh, once you've clicked on the orange button that says, I accept the Turnitin EULA, you can submit and your work will be run through Turnitin automatically. Um, so that is the only tricky thing that there is with Turnitin. It's such a smooth process that you do not have to stress about it. Um, so, once you've submitted your assignment and you've clicked saved and submit for your assignment, you will then have to wait for your exam, for your report. As I said, this is only available during the uh, term time. Uh, oh, sorry, this is only available for assignments, not for exams. Um, and you might have to wait up to 48 hours to get the, res, uh, the report back. So if it says queued, that's not an error. Just be patient. It will eventually show. Um, if it says report unavailable, that usually means that the file you've handed in is corrupt um, and you might have to resubmit your file. Um, uh, make sure that the file itself is working. So please make sure that you um, that 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 you check that uh, after 48 hours that the report can be available so that um, you don't get this message and your file might be corrupted by mistake or something. And then lastly, it doesn't happen often, but you know, sometimes it happened. Um, you know, it happens um, uh, very rarely, but if it says error, then you need to contact your lecturer and they will contact the Turnitin administration team to assist with this problem. Again, this is why that 48 hour window is so important. All right, so it's 48 hours has passed. You come back to your assignment and you find this little button, uh, this little uh, thing underneath your assignment. That really is, that is the Turnitin report. Uh, you can click on that report. Um, and it will open up for you. So what is a Turnitin originality report? So basically it provides a summary of matching text found, found in your uh, assignment. Um, it tells you what did the sources match to? So what, what is it saying exists already? Um, 
to what extent is there matching? Um, and um, if the higher the percentage is, so you can see this document is at 53%, the higher the percentage is, the higher um, the likelihood of non-original uh, content being in. So content that matches something else. So what is matching text? So that's simply it's text found in your assessment that matches text in other places. So for example, um, academic articles, the World Wide Web, other people's assessments, but not all matching text is problematic, okay? Um, you are often asked to submit things like honesty declarations. Um, and then you suddenly you hand it in and then you see you have a 10% match and you know, you're stressing because you thought you had done everything right and then you open a document and, and you say, okay, but what is flagged is your honesty declaration. So it's not necessarily that it is all bad, uh, that, that it's automatically that you've done something wrong if there's some matching text found. But what it is um, problematic is if the text matches something that you have not acknowledged that is similar to what somebody else has written or is exactly the same as um, somebody else has written, um, uh, uh, if you haven't used quotation marks properly, sometimes you get something, uh, you know, I, I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, um, uh, but they, they, there's some standard phrases that is used in, um, uh, in in academic work, um, you know, lawyers, it might be as it pleases your magistrate or your you know your majesty. Um, for anthropologists, we would something like the uh, you know um, uh, writing as text, ethnography as a type of text. Um, you know that would be phrases that would be used quite quite often. So. There will be sure there will be some matches within the document if you and that's not per se a problem as long as you have um referenced where it is appropriate. Um so it's very important. All reports must be interpreted. Take the time and learn to interpret your own reports. Check what is shown as flagged. Make sure that you've re referenced properly. Paraphrase where it's appropriate. OK, and this question comes up a lot. What is an acceptable percentage? There we go. I've got 53 percent. You know what's acceptable? Can I have 10 percent? Can I have 20 uh, percent? The answer is there is no acceptable percentage. OK, plagiarism is always wrong. If you have plagiarized in your assessment, it is unacceptable, whether it's like 5 percent or 50 percent. OK, so somebody with a 5% match that has a um, that has uh, copied and pasted a paragraph directly from another source um, is 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 unacceptable. While somebody might have a 20% um, similarity index, but that 20% is a song that was properly acknowledged, but is still showing us as as, as um, showing somewhere, uh, you know, being picked up somewhere else. So please, there is no, don't ask your lecturer what is an acceptable percentage. The answer is none. Plagiarism is not acceptable at the University of South Africa or at any other university. So take the time to analyze your report and understand what it says. So what does it look like? This is basically what a uh, similarity report would look like. So you can see it shows you the similarity, the 62%, and then it shows you what are the matches for this uh, in the, found in this report. And you can see it show, you can either see the top sources or all sources. And you can see here, look, it says um, this blue comes from a um, university of oh, like this, yeah, it's blue. This comes from an um, a, a article, and there's a 22% match there. 
So there we go. And now you can go look at it and it's like, OK, so what happened here? Maybe I didn't rewrite it in my own words. I copied and pasted and I meant to rewrite it and I forgot, you know, but now I can go and fix it so that there is no longer a similarity. Be careful. You can't just and I just um, if you have text in quotation marks, it will um, it will not pick it up, but you cannot have paragraph after paragraph of text um, in quotation mark and think, OK, but now I've referenced. You need to write it in your own words to show your own understanding. Even if you have a, um, you know, if you have paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of text that's the same and you've put them in quotation marks and slapped a reference at the at the end, your lecturer will consider that as plagiarism as well because you're not internalizing, you're not writing your own words. Um, you're just patching, patching, patch, doing some patch writing. All right, here you can see um, it shows all of the sources and it literally shows you everything um, that has been found um, uh, to, to match. So how do I reduce the percentage found? Don't focus on trying to reduce the percentage. Focus on producing your own work. Um, talk to your lecturer about what they're expecting. Improve your academic writing skills so that you can write in your own words. Um, and make sure that you... Um, that that you reference properly with both quotation marks if you're quoting directly, um, uh, that you are using um, a reference list plus in-text referencing. Um, the best way that you're going to 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 reduce the percentage of similarity in a report is if you have internalized the work, you've practiced your writing skills, and you can. Um, go forward from there. I also recommend that you keep your process documents as you are going as you're working on your on your work, you're making notes, keep those documents because you need to go if you are you might have lost a reference and now you have your documents and you can easily go back to um, to fixing whatever the problem is. And that is it from me. Thank you very much. And I hand back over to you, Denzel. Thank you so much, Ingrid, for that. I think you provided the students with a lot of key information specifically in terms of why this is important for them as students. And I, and I think you really stressed that point and brought home about the academic integrity and the consequences in terms of our qualifications as well. And I think those latter parts where you really brought in some key ideas and tips on how to avoid those I percentages uh, are something that is very important. Uh, and I know there's questions regarding referencing, et cetera, textbooks. Those are all key questions. But remember, even at honors level, anything that you cite, anything that you use must be referenced, even if it is from a prescribed textbook. And that will help you uh, to even when the plagiarism, uh, even when the Turnity in reports come in to justify that these are actual quotations from the text. So that is very important referencing techniques. So thank you very much, Ingrid, for that. And I'm hoping the students actually uh, engage with that more strategically as well. Now we move on to another section, which also speaks to a further insight of the resources that are available to you and also some of the key tools that you can use as part of your searches and in order to enhance your writing uh, and your assessments as well. So it's my pleasure at this time to invite Ms. Milan to the floor and she's from the library and she's going to provide us with some really good insightful uh, ideas of how the library is uh, can benefit you as a student and I think take careful note of some of the, the platforms that she's going to share with you and some of the tools because this is really for the benefit of you as a student and thank you so much uh, Melanie for joining us I know these this is after hours and we want to say from our team that we really appreciate you taking the time and engaging with the students today. So let me hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Denzel. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session. Yes, I had a very 
big task on my shoulders to um, give you an introduction to the library because there are just so much to show you. So the purpose of this session is literally just to show you the basics of what is available in the library and then you will be handed over to your own personal librarian to which I'm going to refer you just now um, to give you more detailed training. So basically this session is just to give you the overview of all the services that are available and then to show you how to find articles and books for your for your studies and then um, some of your modules will also have prescribed and recommended reading I'll show you how to get hold of that and then um, just searching for additional material as you go along so hopefully this will put you on the way of of using the library and then you can go to uh, the other librarians for more detailed training Right, so let's just show you first of all how you get to the library. So you can access our library from the UNISA homepage or from my UNISA. And on both of them, you will see there is a gray bar and the library has a link there. You can also access it by logging into my, uh, my UNISA and then looking for the library on the drop down. But it's not really necessary to log in because everything is available on the normal library website where you can access it from either way um, of these two platforms. Once you are in the library, this is how the first part of the library page looks like and it's quite busy. So I'm just going to focus on a few of the things that are shown here um, just to give you an idea of how you can just start finding your material. I've also given you the direct link to the library if you would like to, you know, just um, bookmark it somewhere. Right, so basically what I'm going to focus on today is how you can find additional material using this little search engine that I have tried to highlight in the white. It's a bit of a busy screen. And then also your e-reserves, your recommended books, your prescribed books. In other words, all your recommended and additional reading material that you will find here under that little block called find e-resources. So we're basically just going to focus on those two for, for now. Um, and then you can get further training from your own personal librarian. Then I'm also going to delve a little bit deeper into the services that are on offer for you so that you know what, what type of services you are entitled to. Right, so I basically, um, I'm, I'm going to work from this little yellow block. It's on the library's homepage, just under that little picture of the library. You will see these are yellow, yellow blocks. So if you click there on services for postgraduate students, this page will open and you will see there's quite a lot of different blocks and a lot of information is available for you here. But obviously we can't go through all of it, so I'm going to highlight the most important ones for you tonight. So, of course, the personal librarian, I'm one of them, so I put that first. <laughs> so basically, um, if you know your personal librarian, then this is not for you. But if it is still a mystery person, how you can find out who your personal librarian is, is on that, um, that services for postgraduate students. The first little block is personal librarian. So this group of librarians, of which I'm one of them, are um, sort of focused on a specific college. So we are allocated to either a whole school within a college or some department. So we have various um, departments and schools that we are responsible for. And then we do the training for that group. So all the postgraduate students um, should actually go through our hands um, right from diploma to doctorate. So um, that is the, what we basically are focusing on. We want to make sure that you can search and find the information you need without assistance. That is part of research and it is a good skill to have um, going forward. And especially if you want to do your master's and doctorate, if you can get this under your belt now, that will really help you in the long term. So basically we do group training sessions for our college or our school. And then we also we have a more subject specific focus. And then we also offer one on one training or individual training. If you are really stuck and you can't move forward, we 
offer one-on-one -on -one training as well. You can contact your personal librarian to set up a meeting and that can happen in person or using uh, Teams as we are now, but then it's just the personal librarian and yourself in it. You can share screens, you can show what you are struggling with, and then your personal librarian will be able to show you how to do whatever your requirement is. Right, so that is the personal librarians. So if you don't know who your personal librarian is, once you click on that personal librarian block, you will see all the colleges display. So I'm just going to show you where I am, but obviously depending on your subject or your college, you will click on your specific one. But say for instance, there's a student in um, the audience for economic and management sciences, you would click there. And then it will show you who the personal librarians are for that specific college. So here you can see we are two in the college and the subjects are divided between um, Miss Leanne Brown and myself. So every college has their own personal librarians responsible for specific departments. So when you go in there, you can precisely find who is responsible to train you. And then you can email them or you can phone them. Right, so then the next service that I want to make you aware of is the branch um, service or the branch libraries. So the branch librarians work in the branch libraries and we have branch libraries across South Africa and as well as Ethiopia. So to know where a specific branch library is, you will then basically just click on the gray block that says branches and opening hours. And then you will be able to see where in South Africa those branches are. The librarians working in these branches, they are qualified librarians, and they can also help you to find literature and show you how to do that when you go in person to one of those branches. And then while you are there, you will have free Wi-Fi to search for literature. So um, that is another option that you have just remember that you need a library card for 75 Rand. It's usually included when you do your registration that you can tick it. If you didn't, you must just contact your branch library just to hear how you must go about um, getting that library card. But the whole library is actually online. So the need for actually going into a, a physical library is really getting less as we speak. Right, so that is the branch librarians. This is just a screen capture to show you when you click on that branch librarian uh, branch libraries um, button, you can see the way um, the branch is, the contact details when they're available, the times. I can see it's closed at the moment on Saturdays, and yeah, you are welcome to phone them before you go and just um, here if you are, can come in and make arrangements for yourself. They also offer library training, but it's more on a basic level. They actually focus on undergraduate, but really if you are just starting with your honours, you've never actually studied with UNISA, it might be good for you to also attend some of these branch librarian training sessions, just to sort of get the feel of how the library works and how to search. So you will find more information when you click here on that training and skill support, then it will give you more information about the training that is on offer and then there's also a library guide that will give you um, a space to book for sessions and that is the link where you can go in and then actually schedule sessions uh, that you can attend just similar to what we've done today right so I would advise people that are feeling a little bit <laughs> jittery I'm just starting off to actually do the training with them Right, then the next uh, service is um, the information search librarians and they do searches for students. So that is like a, a just a, a introductory type of list of references that you can request from the library. And you will also find that on uh, the blocks that I'm just going through under the postgraduate services. So you will see there's a block that says literature search service and this is a a form that you have to fill in telling the librarian precisely what it is that you need, what 
type of literature and then you submit the form. They then do the search for you and send you a list of references with links to the full text that you can make use of. It's free of charge. You can, you can use it as many times as you wish. Just keep in mind that they can also get quite busy and I'm sure after this session they will be pretty busy. So it might mean that, it's, that you are going to wait a week or so before you get that list because it's only a small group of librarians who actually do that. So don't um, request the search and expect it to, to be in your inbox the next day. So it takes a bit of time. Right, so once you click on that literature search um, block, you will see this little screen opening and if you look very closely, you will see under how do I request a literature search a link. It says here, please click here. That opens the literature search request form that you must fill in. There's also another way to get hold of it. It's if you log into My Unisa and then you go to your My Modules, it will then um, show. Mine shows staff, but yours will say student. And there's a there's a library um, sort of link inside My, uh, My Unisa, and you will find a literature search request form there as well. Right, I've also given you the link. You must, must see if this opens. It opens for me, but sometimes you know your computer will not allow you to open it you can try the link at the bottom otherwise either through the library page the literature search service or via myonisa then in terms of borrowing and returning books so as a postgraduate student an honor student you are allowed to take out 16 printed books at a time you have access to unlimited ebooks and articles so a lot of our material is electronic nowadays because it's such a big university and there are people all over South Africa. So getting printed books to people is really quite difficult. So we are really investing a lot of money in providing electronic books for you to access online and you don't have to go into a library to get hold of it. It's on your computer and you can make use of it there. So um, you can use the library catalog and just type in the title of a book to see if we have access to it and then you can request it from the library catalog. But this is basically what you need to know is that you can take out 16 books at a time. When you have your printed books um, at your desk at home, then um, you will see that the due date is going to storm up to you and then you have to either renew the book or you have to take it back to the library. It's really important to do that because um, after a while they are going to put a fine on your library account and they are going to block you from using the library. They even block you from getting your, your um you use your, your marks after an exam and things like that. So make sure you don't fall in the strap. So when the due date is there, you can go on the library page right to the bottom of the page. You will see there's a big blue um, block full of little white icons and one of them says my library account. You log in with your student number, my UNISA password, and then it will show you all the printed books that you have out on your name and it will give you a little button to um, renew your books. And that way you can keep the books longer if the system allows you to renew your books. If for some reason you are unable to renew it, then you really have to phone the library or um, bring the books back or post it very, very quickly. Otherwise, you are going to get a fine. So this is a, just an online service that you can make use of. Right, so those are all the basic services that um, you will have um, to your um, to be able to um, get service from the library. Right now, to get hold of your e-reserves, recommended book, uh, books, prescribed books. So those are usually in your TAT 101 letter. It will be under the um, heading of prescribed and recommended books or e-reserves, as some of them call them. So um, then the lecturer will give you then a list of articles or books that you must read and we make it available on the libraries page and I want to show you how to get hold of that. Again from the libraries page which we now know where it is you will see there's a little button called find e-reserves. 
And that is where you will find your e-reserves recommended prescribed books. They also call it sometimes reading material. So whatever is on your tat letter, that is it. <laughs> so when you click on find e-reserves, um, the steps to follow, um, I've just marked it for you, one, two, three. So basically when you click on that find e-reserve, it's going to open this small little block. And that is where you type in your module code and you click on submit. Then if it picks it up, it's going to look similar to this. It's going to pick up the, the module code and then it's going to tell you electronic reserves or prescribed books or recommended books. What is important is to look for 2024. Don't go using um, the other older years because that's not relevant anymore. So always just look for 2024 and when you click on that, it will then give you the list and all of these are full text. When you click on that link, it will have give you the option to download that article or chapter. So that is a list that you can easily access to get hold of all those material in your TAT 101. Right, so that sort of will sort you out for, for most of your assignments, but in many cases they're going to ask you to find additional literature to use in an assignment. And this is also what I want to show you how to make use of. Before I even show you how to do it on the library, it's important to understand how the library system works and what happens when you are off campus. So when you are searching on the internet, and yes, I know everybody's using Google Scholar. So if you are on Google Scholar, you will find that some of the articles can actually be opened without any problem. That's what we call open access. In other words, it's open for anybody to use. But then usually the very good articles that you would actually like, you will see that you get this type of block where they ask you for money or they say you have to try and log in and it gives a funny screen. Those those are the ones that we, the library pays for the subscription and it's only available to registered st students. And the only way that the publisher knows that you are a registered student is if you go through a screen that looks like this, the UNISA Central Authentication Service. So it's only when you fill in your student number and your MyUNISA password here that you will gain access. And when you just randomly on any search engine like Google Scholar, you will never get the screen, so you will not be able to open something. So I want to show you a very nice new tool that we have that will make your life much easier. And that is, um, I will show that a little bit uh, later on for you. But basically, this is just so that you can remember um, later on. The tool I want to show you is this little button. It's very small on a screen, but it's got this, it looks like a teardrop and it says download PDF. I'm going to show you how you can install this little thing, which means when you are on Google Scholar and you have installed this little piece of software, it will pull you through to this authentication screen. And when you type in your student number and your MyUNISA password, it will open that article. So you don't necessarily have to go to the library to, to find it there. You can use Google Scholar, and but you must have this little button um, installed and I'll show you how to do that. So even when you are searching on the library's um, pages, you will also be confronted with this. So now you understand how important it is that you do get authenticated, otherwise a lot of material will not open for you. Right, so that magic tool that I want to show you, it's called Lipkey Nomad. So it's just a browser extension that you can install on any browser. And what it does is once it's installed, it will look at the article. And if it knows that we have the, the article available in the library, it will give you access without you even going to the library. So the steps to install this little browser extension, you start at this URL. And I will share the PowerPoint with you so that you have this link to actually access it. Then um, it, the screen looks like this, but if you scroll down, you will see all the browsers at the bottom of the screen. So depending on the browser that you are using, you will click on that browser icon. And these are the steps once you um, click on that browser icon. So these are my steps. So I click on Chrome in this case. Then it asks you, add Lipkey Nomad. And then you just say to it, add extension. 
then you click on the little button at the Chrome and then the screen will open. And all you have to do is just type in University of South Africa into that little block and it will then pick up UNISA. And after that installation, the, irrespective of where you are, and it picks up a full text article for you, it will give you this little green um, button to, to actually open that specific article. So in other words, when you see this, all the purchase options and things like that, you will see this little icon in the bottom left corner. You click on it, you get authenticated and it will open the article for you. And I think this is really going to make your life much easier. So you don't have to always first go through to the library. You can actually search anywhere as long as you have the Slipkey Nomad installed. As soon as you click on that button and you are authenticated, you will then have the full text of either the book or the article. And if it's an article, you will be able to download or print that specific article. So then you will have a copy on your computer to read and use in your assignments. All right, so I'm going to zoom into the library now, um, specifically the search engine that nearly works like a Google Scholar. So you can also make use of that. Again, from the library's page, you will see the, it has a little block there with the, it, the words advanced search below that. That is our library Google. So whatever keywords you type in here will be searched and it will give you results based on the words that you type in. So basically, you can, for instance, type in the title of an article. So if, say, for instance, you are reading an article and in the list of references, you see a very nice article that you don't have yet. All you do is you take the title of that article, you put it in that little search box, you click on search, and then it will throw out a screen with that title if we have it available. And then all the screens always look very similar. It will have these little buttons at the bottom of the reference. So this tells you it's a journal article and there is your PDF. So if you click on the PDF, it will open the PDF automatically. Article page will open the page where the PDF is available. So it doesn't open immediately. You have a secondary screen to open. And then there's another option of full text online. So depending on the, the reference that it picks up, you will have either all of them or one of them. But whatever is at the bottom, you click on to get access to it. So in other words, you sit with the reference, you type it in on the search engine, and then it will throw it out for you like that, and you will have the ability to download that article. And the same goes for books. So if you see a book somewhere, you just take the title of that book, pop it into the search box at the top of, your, of the library homepage, and then it will show you the book. So we have a lot of ebooks, as I said, but we also have a lot of printed books. We have over a million printed books in the in the main library. So they are there to also request. So the full text book, you will click on that button to access. But if it is a printed book, you click on that link and it will open a screen where you will see this request option. And that is how you request a printed book. Right, so that's um, when it opens, um, you will see your name is there because you have to be authenticated. And at the bottom, there's a submit, and that, that is how you send the request through to the library. And then we will go and find it on the shelf, or if it's taken out, it might take a bit longer, but then we will send the book to you as soon as it's available. In terms of ebooks, what is very important to remember that is that every book is a bit different. Some of the books you may download the whole book. No problem at all. Others um, allow you to download a chapter or a few pages, um, and others you may only view online. And you will see that information on the screen of an ebook. You must just look through the screen to see what you are allowed to do with it. It is dependent on the publisher, so every book is, can, you know, have its own restrictions. It's all about copyright and what they allow us to make available to you. So just be guided by the icons and the information that it displays when you click here on that full text online for your electronic books. Right, so now you have your e-reserves. Um, if you have a title of a book or an article, you've got that. Now you also, in some cases, will need to look for additional material to use in your assignments.
So again, we are going to use this little block. This is where everything happens. So um, you can type in keywords there and the, the words that you type in will determine what you get out of the system. So it's very important to know that you must only use words. You must never type in a whole title or a whole paragraph of what you are looking for. Look at the topic at hand and identify the main words that you want to see in a book or an article. And then those are the words you are going to type in into this little search box. So I'm going to give you one or two tips in terms of how you can type it in to make sure that you pick up the correct information because it's very reliant on the way you type it in and what you type in. Right, so just the basics of searching and that also even goes for Google Scholar. The basic principle is the more words I type in, the less I'm going to get. So this is just an example, a very broad example, but you can see how the results go down. If I just put in one word, we're taking sustainable development goals just as an example. If you just put in one word, you will see that you get over 3 million results. And of course, you will not be able to go through all of them. As soon as you type in another keyword, you will see how your results go down. Three words, it even goes down more. And if I type in quite a number of words, specifying precisely what it is that I'm looking for, look at the result list. So from 3 million to just, over, just under 300. So you can see that this is really the, 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 the foundation of, of finding the correct information. So if you type in words and you don't pick up the right um, Top, write articles and books, it means that the words that you are using are not correct. So play around, type in different keywords and see what, what are the articles and books that you are retrieving. You cannot break the system. So play around and see how you can, um, you know, add your keywords to make sure that you get everything that you, that you need. But the basic um, thing is the more words I type in, the less references I retrieve. Then there's another cool um, way that you can search, and that is what we call phrase searching. So if you look at the word sustainable development goals, it's a concept containing three words. So if you just type it in, you will see you get quite a lot. But as soon as I put in those little inverted commas, can you see how it went down? So that's another thing that you can make use of. So if you have a concept con that consists of two or more words, put it in inverted commas and it will also help you to get more relevant results. Because what this tells you is the word sustainable and the word development and the word goals must just be somewhere, not necessarily a concept where those three words stand next to one another. So this is a really a very valuable tool that will help you to limit your results. So once you have now typed in your keywords, this is a typical screen that you are going to see. It always looks like this. So on the left hand side, you can limit your results, meaning you can limit by publication date and you can also just look at journal articles and books, which are very important because you don't want to go to newspapers and trade publications and things like that because they are not scholarly or peer reviewed. In other words, it's not academic quality. And peer review means that before an article is published, there's a group of people or one or two people looking at that article to make sure that it's high quality and only then it is published. That's peer review. So it's really important that you don't just use anything you, you lay your hands on. Make sure that it is scholarly or peer reviewed and the way to do it is to do this journal article and books, ebooks over here. And then you can limit by publication date. Um, as soon as you do that, you will see that all your selections of your filters appear here in the top left corner and it stays there while you're searching. And then you basically just get a list of publications with those little icons that I've already explained to you. And then you will be able to access all these articles and books uh, for your assignment or project or whatever you're busy with. So it's extremely easy to use and just play around with your keywords and your phrase searching. 
I just wanted to make sure that you know your limits. So your publication date is usually five years. You do not want to use very old publications. Of course, if it's a very important publication, you can use it. But when somebody looks at your list of references, most of them must be um, very recent. So usually it's a five year um, range of years that you use, but you can also ask your lecturer about that. But usually it's five years and you li literally just click on that button and then it will take out all the old publications for you. And then the other limit was that journal article and books, just so that you can remember to do that. And that is now the end of what I have to show you. So in conclusion, there are two buttons that I showed you. I believe that those are the most important ones, just so that you can get started with finding information be it your um, list of, ref of material in your TAT 101, that is your e-reserve pattern, or if your assignment requires you to look for more additional material, then you are going to use that little block. But really, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have so many resources, and I can really spend days with you to, to show you everything. And that is where your own personal librarian will come in, because um, things about referencing styles. Every college has their own referencing style and um, the research methodology. There are databases that you can use to, to learn about research methods if that is required. So there's a lot of subject related content that your personal librarian will show you. But as long as you just know that you can search for literature here in this little block and your prescribed and recommended material is in that block, then I hope that I have achieved what I set out to show you tonight. So, but contact your personal librarian and um, just hear if there are training sessions that you can join or contact your personal librarian for individual assistance. And just remember, we are here to assist you. If you really feel um, lost at the moment, contact your personal librarian and we will be there for you to help you to make sure that you make a success of your studies. Don't be scared to contact us. We have a lot of patients and we really love what we are doing and we want to help you. Right, so that's all from my side. I don't know if there are any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then uh, we can take the questions. Thank you so much, Melanie, for this. This was actually excellent. And from the comments, I can see that you've made a great impact with the students with this session and very valuable uh, with, with, with the information that you've passed on. So this is definitely, and I'm sure that the students will benefit from this. And I'm hoping that the students take advantage of the information that you've provided. Also, re-watch this video session again, because I think you've given them abundant information to explore. And, uh, and I think what was interesting here is that many of our students don't know the important work that is being done by the library. And I think uh, what you've done here is really uh, broken it down so simply and said we are providing these services and we are here to help you. So thank you so much, man. We really appreciate this. Uh, I think for we move on to the next session. I think there's a lot. There's, there is some questions, not so much questions, but comments in the chat, but I think you've covered majority of it as part of your presentation. Uh, let's move on to the next session. Uh, it's my pleasure at this time to invite uh, David Alperstad to the floor, and he's going to run with us on the platform itself, my modules. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Denzel, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And for those students who indicated they're breaking their fast, I hope you will be able to catch up with the the recording so you don't miss anything. All right, so let me get straight into it, guys. Um, Thank you once more. That was brilliant, Miss Milan. I actually enjoyed it myself. I'm an honor student, so <laughs> it's definitely useful to know all these things that are coming up. Uh, let me just switch off my camera, guys, because I want to eat up all your bandwidth. There we go. OK, so let's get into it, guys. So now we're going back to my module. So basically carrying on from where Richard stopped, uh, we're going to now continue from there. I'm just going to put it full mode. OK, so I'm going to look at my modules and my admin. OK, so it's very important to just to distinguish between the two because uh, my modules, guys, is really much where you're going to do most of your activities, find your resources, submit your assignments, act with other students, the e-groups. It really all sits under the my module section. Now, hopefully you guys are already in this, so it might not be new to you. But if you have just joined UNISA, maybe it is something new. So that's why we just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. 
Then my admins, the other side, that's where you can get like update your personal information, your academic records, and that can be emailed directly to you. So that's actually very useful. So I'm going to start there with my admin side. So as I said, you can get your academic record there, guys. It, it sends an email to your My Life email account. That's why it's important to have access to that so that you don't have to travel all the way to a regional center just to get something quick and easy. And it's also stamped as well. So you can use it for official purposes as well. Then your biographical details. Yes, you can update certain information. I did see uh, one of the students was asking right in the beginning of session about updating your cell phone contact number. Okay, now that one, you're going to need to do it on campus. So there's a form you'll fill in or you can do it via email but then we'll have to verify your details to make sure that it's you requesting that change. So that's just to prevent people from changing your cell phone number and having access to your date and things like that. So that's why we've really put it in. And also as Richard explained about the MFA, the multi-phase uh, authentication, that also prevents people from making changes to your information. That's why you get that PIN or use the authentication app um, that will verify that it's you accessing your information. So it's very, very important. Uh, Richard also showed you that's the same place under my admin where you can change your password. Just remember, guys, when you change your password under my admin, it will synchronize with Microsoft, and then your My Life password will also change to exactly the password that you created. So it's one password for all the accounts. Now, the admins, my admin side, you only use your student number. Um, just like Ms. Milan showed you, same method there and your same password. But for everything else, my UNISA, my modules and my life, you will log in with your full email address. So that's also important. You can also edit your registration within the registration period, um, especially with those guys that want to add modules or remove modules. But there are processes that you need to follow and just be uh, careful about the financial impact because sometimes if you cancel late or change late, it might be a little fee that comes along with that. So just be careful of that, but that you can find it from your nearest campus and you can just check the contact details, which I'll share a little bit later as well. You can check your financial details, speaking about that, and you can also track your parcel trackings also done in the same place. Um, although that's very limited nowadays with everything going online, there's less and less materials that actually get sent to you. And of course, you can do a study fees quotation as well. So that's for your employer. If you need to give them a quotation, if they're paying for you, uh, that's a, a nice option over there that you can also do. And it has the letterhead and everything, so it looks pretty good. Of course, as Richard also did allude to, you can also check your assignments, your exam information. It's also available under my admin. Um, but of course, now in the beginning of the year, early in the year, don't worry too much about the exam timetables. I think for now, it's really much getting on with your assignments, making sure everything's up to date. So students, please do check your modules. We, we can't stress that enough uh, because a lot of the questions you guys were asking in the beginning, it should be in the announcements, which I'm still going to get to, and, and your additional resources. So make sure you're checking all those resources at least once a week to make sure you're not missing everything. Okay, as Richard explained, we do have the password management and you can change it, but just take note, there is a little op, a little notification that pops up with a green little tick saying it has been changed. Uh, but generally, unless someone knows your password, I don't think it's necessary to change your password immediately. Uh, rather get into your studies, but it is a good feature just to know where it's sitting. So be careful when you click submit, just click one time, hey, and then wait for the system. Okay, now the literature, we've actually covered that, so I'm not going to be doing that one. So I'm going to continue over here with my modules. Uh, this is a live presentation, guys. So if Richard's making adjustments, um, then you would actually see those adjustments happening in real time. That's why I just saw that slide popping up. Okay, so we're using our Microsoft platform, actually, a live presentation. Okay, so now, as you guys will understand, there are certain different types of modules that come along. Um, for you guys, postgrads, it might look a little bit different but you do have an official site. So when you register, this is the official site that it gets assigned to you. So you'll see your module code. It'll tell you which year and which semester or year module, then it'll have a zero. And that's pretty much where all the information sits. All right. Some modules will have a tutor site, but normally you get an SMS to say now you've been grouped, you can engage with your e-tutor. 
and then you'll see the site looks similar, but then it just has a bit of numbers and an E at the end in this case for a tutor site, where again you will interact. And then of course we do have group sites, but this is really for your signature modules, um, which probably none of you guys will be doing because this is usually undergrad modules, uh, things like EUP where there's a group site that you have to interact and you actually work through the module through this group site at work. It's a very different module though, that approach that they use. So these are just the basic things that you will come across um, during your studies at Tunisia. Um, but as postgrad students, don't worry too much about group sites. I think that one, it's only for undergrads. All right, so when you log in, guys, you'll see something like this. You'll see this banner and it will change quite often. So just see what's happening on the banner because sometimes there are events that happen and there's links to resources. So it's also good just to see them popping up over here. You'll see your My Modules will be in the middle. And there's my admin. So when you click on my admin, you'll see it opens its own page where you'll just log in with your student number only and the same password. All right, so just remember that's slightly different from my admin. So basically then you'll see here's your calendar and you'll see this calendar pops out quite often and you can actually see there's certain items that needed to be done. Um, and this is from last year as well. When you click on my modules, guys, this is where you'll see all the modules linked and all the other resources that are given to you. OK, so this one you can see it's seriously lots of them, so don't panic if yours isn't that many. It's perfectly normal, uh, but in case this is Rich's account, so hence it has a lot more modules. But yes, you'll see your course site and there you'll see there's a tutor site there and you're simply going to click on it. Then you'll see your profile, so see on the right hand side. And Richard is going to cover it. You please, you can upload your profile picture already, um, guys. So you can put your profile, but we will speak about it. But that's where you will see your profile picture showing once you've uploaded it. But when you click on your profile, you'll see here's all the other options that you can also work through just to see what's going on. You will not see edit mode. That's only for us that are doing development work. So don't worry about that one. If you go check out the grades, this is an example. You'll see your module code and you go inside each module. You'll see there's sort of a breakdown that happens and it gives you a whole bunch of information. Your calendar looks like this. Uh, for example, yeah, you'll see assessments. So it just helps you with your planning to see what's coming up. If you've got lots of modules, this calendar can be very, very busy. But yes, you can actually just have a look at it and you can even see the events that are coming up and you simply click on them to get more information. When you go to any of the modules themselves, for example, this COS module, you'll see there's a menu sitting here on the left-hand side. If it's not there, you might just find there's a little semicircle or so. It's orange in color, same color as this one. If you click on it, then the menu will appear. Uh, you might notice, guys, that certain modules look a bit different. Uh, because the layout here might be different in terms of what they've got here in the menu and what's in the main area. Okay, sometimes it's different. Uh, you might actually just need to jump between the two to see where all the information is sitting. But generally speaking, you should be able to get everything here. So this is very important. Start with your announcements and make sure you read all the announcements and the welcome message. Just to gauge where you're at, what's happening with your module, and if there's any other developments. Then also, please check out prescribed materials and official study materials as well. And of course, the additional study materials might also be linked in here. Uh, sometimes it's in this menu, you might just need to look for it. So please work through all those materials, like referencing that you need to do. Most likely there's a document and an announcement already sitting there for you to explain what is required from you. Okay, so from your lectures, your supervisors, that's the type of information you're going to see. Then on the right hand block, it also sort of give you a summary, which allows you then to easily navigate to yourself around the website. But the sooner you get into this, the sooner you start reading all this useful information, um, it will just help you guide you with regards to what's happening in each module that you registered. So here we go, here's the welcome page, for example. So you'll see something like this, and then you might see resources here at the bottom, and you can just see the little arrow right over there. So if you click on it, there's usually more uh, folders and subfolders available. So just take note of that. And you see there's a wealth of information that's sitting here and it's all sitting in your menu. So please do work through this um, to really get you on board and sooner the better uh, so that you make sure you don't miss anything, especially uh, if there's any things that are happening with your module specifically. So that is really your first starting point if you're new to UNISA or for postgrads. 
get onto it as soon as possible. So here we go. So here's official study material. And then you can see there, for example, there's a tutorial 101 or whatever tutorials you'll find. There's usually quite a few. Um, and then you can go read through it just to give you a nice guidance on what's to be expected and how to contact the, the college and things like that. So it's very important that you work through this menu. If there is prescribed books, guys, they'd normally give you a nice list over here. And they also give you the links from the places that you can even potentially buy those books if indeed you need any. But of course, you can now just see you've seen the library. You can go check if the library's got the books or the e-resources for you already, which makes life a lot easier than in terms of finding the materials that you might need. Very important, I'm stressing this one, please go read the announcements. Um, a lot of the time, students come to the computer labs and they're asking questions which are actually sitting right there and the answers are there and they just need to go and read it and they understand what's going on. So every week, check your announcements, make sure you're not missing up on anything, especially like training, um, uh, things like SPSS, if you're doing analytics type of work or statistics, for your module, you know what? There are trainings that are happening and at this and all these type of programs. There's a lot of things happening. So please make sure you check out the announcements, get those dates and make sure you attend those workshops as well. It'll definitely help you as you go along with your studies. Now, there's a little bit of a confusion here with um, the Moodle. I know Unisa that we love to use this word Moodle and then everybody goes and downloads the Moodle app. Guys, the Moodle app is very generic. It is not going to update to the Unisa Moodle, our platform, right? That's just the foundation that we built our My Modules on, but we call it My Module. So you can download the My Modules app that is issued by Unisa. It will have Unisa's details and logo. Then you note know our product, okay? And this, you can then access it with your smartphone. Uh, it's on Google Play. And I think it's also now on the Huawei gallery. I think it's also there now, Richard. So um, I did see that popping up somewhere during the week. Um, and of course, your Apple Play Store as well. So yeah, so that's if you really want to, you can go that way, or you can simply just use the web version of my modules. Profile pick, guys, this is quite important. You can do it already. Um, in other words, you can upload your profile pick. So again, you'll see it's under my modules. You'll go to profile and there's the edit button. All right. So if you click on it, it's going to want you then to upload your picture. So ladies, don't worry about the hairstyle and the makeup and everything. You're beautiful just the way you are. Just have a nice picture of yourself. Yes, you can smile, guys. It's not the end of the world. Just have a nice picture of yourself. Like this guy is very excited to be a Chinese, so he's smiling away. Uh, probably hasn't written an exam yet, so that's why he's still smiling. Um, so then upload your picture, and then you'll see immediately it's going to pop up. So in other words, once you've done the process, you'll see your beautiful picture will be over there. And why is it important? Because it's got to do with your exam. So if there's any assessments or exams and proctoring tools that are going to be needed in the year, that's the profile picture that they are going to use. You can update it if you want from next year to next, from maybe next year you want to do it again. If you've aged that much, maybe you want to, or maybe you want to keep a younger looking picture, that's also fine, but try to have something that's up to date, guys. Um, but yes, so you will need to do this. So get it out the way, get a nice picture, upload it, and then continue with your studies. So it's going to be very similar to the way you do written assignments. It's the same path that you're going to take to upload your picture. Lucky enough, we've got the website for you that's got the detailed steps, one by one by one, how to actually do all these things. And we'll still share that with you as well. So now I'm going to hand back to Richard, who's going to look at the forums and the assessments. And then I'll be back again after that. Over to you, Denzel. Thank you so much, David, for that. I think this was quite critical for our students, specifically the platform and how to manage the platform. Um, I'm hoping that even as you start submitting your assessments for those that are still in the process, that this would help you. And please take note of that profile picture. I think that's a critical one. Uh, so please take note of that as well. So let's move on to the next part. And we now move on on to welcome Richard to the platform again. And he's going to talk to us about the assessment types and submissions. And this goes specifically for those that are working with your assignments and preparing. Thanks, Richard. Uh, let me hand over to you. Thank you, Nezo. So students, we're going to have a look at forums and the types of assessments uh, that you will uh, get through your studies. 
So usually they are, well, generally there are three main ones. It's the quiz activity, assignments activity, and then a forum activity. So forum activity can just be a general discussion uh, that's not graded, but in a lot of instances, the modules, they actually use it as a graded activity as well. We have to uh, participate in a discussion. So these are the three that we will uh, quickly have a look at. So just to make sure that you are able to use these uh, type of activities. So the first one is a forum activity. So this one generally, if it's uh, available to you to create a new topic, it will show a big green button or yellow button there. You click on it and then you can type a new topic out you can edit the text and then post it, and then other people can come to your topic and reply to it. Sometimes it is set up that it's uh, not that you are not able to create a topic, but you can just reply to other students or for, to the main topic. So we will have a look at how you do that exactly. Now I just want you to note, if you reply to somebody, it usually is just plain text. So, but uh, say you now we have to write quite a bit of text, and you want to add bullets and you know make something bold or attach a file. You need to click on the advanced link at the bottom uh, right. So just make sure if you need to type a little bit long, uh, longer text, and it just gives you the ability to add text almost like on Facebook. Then just click on the advanced option, and it will open up for you. So I'm going to share with you the link as well. So we're going to go back to the basic skills. So I'm going to uh, share this, uh, the link with you as well in the chat if you want to uh, join. So it's a Mayunisa forum activity. So as you can see, this one, it doesn't have that option to create a topic. This is uh, basically where you have to um, reply to an existing topic. Now, as you can see here, I'm not logged in, so that's why I can't uh, uh, reply to this one. So it's the same as my modules. Click on login, click on yes, you're a UNISA student, and then you use your UNISA, my UNISA email account to sign in. Now I will be able to reply. Uh, just make sure the first time you're going to access this platform, log in and make sure that you are enrolled. So the enrollment method is on the main page uh, where you can also unenroll yourself after you've completed all the activities. So just make sure on the main page that you are logged in and that you are enrolled. So the activity that we're looking at is under 13. So forum, as we mentioned, is almost like, think of it as Facebook. It's a discussion surrounding a topic. So a lot of times you will have to create the topics. Other times uh, the topic will already be created and you reply to the topic. So as you can see over here, we click on reply. Uh, I can write some uh, uh, reply on here, but I can't, for instance, do bulleting or any additional uh, uh, things on here. But if I click on advanced, now I'm able to actually make this, for instance, uh, uh, bold, for instance. So I'm just going to make it here, my topic list. And then I'm going to say here, uh, number one, number two. And now I can actually make this, for instance, a bulleted list. I can make that, for instance, bold. So it's a lot like Word, so if you're familiar with Word, all of these options will be very familiar with you. You can also, for instance, add an image, record audio, or even a video in some instances as well. Now, you'll a lot of times you were on uh, um, your course once, you'll actually have the option to attach a file. So if you need to submit a, a document, you can attach documents to this as well. So from here, I just click Post to Forums, and it will display on the forums page. So forums are very easy. Sometimes, uh, as I mentioned, it's just for general discussions, uh, but in a lot of courses, they actually use it as a graded activity. Now, the second one that you will encounter is quizzes. So this sort of is basically a MCQ that you do, and it's also very easy. You just start attempt, you work through all the questions one by one, 
and then you click the correct option. So if we have a look at this one on the website, so this falls under uh, lesson 12. So I'm going to copy the link to, for you as well. Just waiting for it quickly to load. Oh, wow, it's taking so long now. Okay, but while it's loading, <clears throat> so remember, uh, uh, if we talk about proctoring as well, some of the modules are actually bringing in proctoring tools for uh, assessments already. So the two that you will usually encounter will be Moodle proctoring, and then the other one will be uh, the Invigilator app, but we will have a look at them. So if we look at the quiz, uh, basically you will get the instructions when is the closing date, and it will give you this, if it gives you this notice over here, Moodle proctoring webcam, this means it's gonna be using uh, a proctoring tool. So just always have a look out for <coughs> this text over here, and this uses Moodle proctoring. Unfortunately, today we won't be able to dive into deep to a little proctoring, but the link is here to the My Exams Guides that takes you step by step and how it works and how to set it up. But if I re attempt this quiz, generally what will happen with little proctoring is your camera will pop up. You need to agree with the validation process and then click on the Start Attempt button. So if it's not using little proctoring, this won't pop up. Uh, for you, you will just go directly into the quiz. So yeah, it will give you a time that's left. How many uh, minutes you still have left to answer the questions? It will give you this navigation as well, where you can navigate between questions. So if you, for instance, skip one, uh, perhaps we want to come back to it. Uh, you can do that as well. Just notice when it comes to exams uh, that uses MCQs. Uh, you will not be able to jump back and forth. It's, you have to answer each question as you go along. So you just select the correct option as you go through uh, all the pages. It might be true and false questions. There are very various types of MCQ types of questions, but really you just select the correct option and proceed. Now for this one, as you can see, it's done completely online, so you have to be online for the entire process. If you get cut off during, you know, uh, while you are answering, it will save all your answers up to a point. You sometimes do get an option as well to re-attempt a quiz as well, while others will only give you one attempt. So just make sure uh, when you actually uh, access this quiz activity, go and have a look and make sure that you've got uh, you know, the instructions correct, how much time you have, when does it open, perhaps if it's a certain time period, uh, when does it close, and do you have additional attempts? So I'll pop the link to this one as well if you want to test it out. Just remember for this one as well, you need to be logged in and enrolled for this course to be able to attempt it. Now, the one that's perhaps more prevalent to you would be uh, an upload assignment. So generally, these are the written assignments. So already get used to doing it in Microsoft Word, save it as a PDF so it is compatible with Turnitin, uh, the Turnitin software. As we mentioned on this portal that we have, there's a, a, a Microsoft Word basic course and a Microsoft Word advanced course. So the basic one really helps you to just do an assignment online while well, the advanced one takes you through a whole dissertation, how you can use the referencing tools uh, and automatic, uh, how can I say, content tools within Microsoft Word. I saw a question earlier about also, do we get a license for Microsoft Word? Yes, you do. I will share the link a bit later as well. So with a, uh, um, a, uh, Upload assignment activity, it's very easy. You do the assignment in Microsoft Word, you save it as a PDF, and then you upload your document. So if we have a look on the site at uh, this one, I'm gonna go to assignment activity. I'll share the link with you as well. If you wanna test this out. So generally 
on the assignment activity, you will get your instructions, or it might be a down, uh, instructions that you need to download. Another place where these instructions are also sometimes is under additional resources or on the tutorial letter. So that's why it's very important to always start with your tutorial letter uh, as that tells you exactly how the course is structured and how you're going to be assessed for that specific one. So as we mentioned, this is a fairly easy one. You just add a submission. So you just uh, click on it after you've completed your Word document and saved it to a PDF. You will come to this page where it will ask you to confirm, uh, acknowledge that this is your own work. Just have a look at the maximum file size. It's usually very big, so I generally don't uh, necessarily go over it. But if you do, they are online PDF tools such as ilovepdf.com, where you can upload a PDF and then uh, reduce the size. You can also merge PDFs, so a lot of times you have to perhaps add a declaration that's already in a PDF, and now you've got your two files that you need to combine. And so really go have a look at it. It's I love PDF. You can combine it, you know, cut it, divide it up, all of that to work with PDFs. Uh, so as you can see, for instance, this one, we've got 80 megabytes, so that's quite big, but we can only upload one file. And if we look here at the bottom, it's only a PDF document uh, that's allowed. So what you need to do, you can drag and drop a file on here, but if you're on a device where you can't just uh, easily drag and drop, just click on this Add File option. Uh, just note on the left-hand side, if you accidentally click on one of these other options, always just make sure you go back to the Upload a File option. From here, you can go to Choose a File. You can go then to um, the file that you saved. So I'm just going to upload one quickly here. Open. Now, I always advise when you select a file, make sure the name appears next to this choose a file option before you click the upload this file of, uh, button. Because what happens sometimes, it takes it perhaps a bit longer to upload, and you click the upload this file button, and it gives you an error. And it doesn't generally explain to you that it was the file was not ready, ready yet for submission. So just make sure the name does appear next to the uh, choose a file button and then you can click on Upload this file. Once you've done this, you can just simply click on Save Changes, and it will give you that your submission has been successfully submitted. Now, what I really advise is once you submit it, scroll down. You'll see you can edit the submission, so you can always go back and upload a new file, but make sure on this file submission, Click on the PDF file, make sure it opens, that it's the correct file, and that you it doesn't require a password. Because what happens quite a lot is, you know, in that time when you're submitting, you've been working on the assignment, you're tired, you select the incorrect file, you perhaps uh, name the file also the module code, and then you look for that module code, you select it, and it ends up being your tutorial letter. And another thing is sometimes you use software that's automatically set to set a password to it. So just always make sure that you do uh, um, are able to easily open the file that you submitted. Now we come to <clears throat> proctoring tools. So proctoring tools really depends, um, you know, what type of assessments you're going to be doing. Uh, if you're going to be have, doing a written exam, uh, you will be using one of the proctoring tools. Uh, if you perhaps have some of the quiz assignments, you might be using the Moodle proctoring as well. So the institution currently uses three different uh, proctoring tools. The first one is Moodle proctoring, and this is used for quiz assignments and MCQ exams. This is simply a camera that takes a picture of you. So you just need a device with a camera. It could be a laptop, a desktop with a webcam, or your cell phone. The second one is the Invigilator app. And this is for written assignments and take-home exams. The take-home exams are also just generally, you can think of it as written exams. And then there's a third one, Iris Invigilation. It's only used uh, by CSET. 
uh, for now for general students, but they also use it for for in case for CTA students. So just make sure that you know exactly which uh, proctoring tool you will be using, if any. Now, IRIS is used in uh, College of Science, Engineering and Technology for MCQ and take home exams. But just note you will never use more than one tool for a assessment. So make sure you've got the, uh, how can I say you know exactly which tool you're going to be using. So on the website, we actually have exam proctoring tool guide that we can type in your module code and it will give you exactly what type of proctoring tool you will be using for, uh, say, when your exams come. But I would advise doing it now already because it does get updated usually about two weeks before the exams or three weeks. And we have additional workshops that we run during this time to really help you um, uh, how can I say prepare for the examinations? Now, just a quick look at Moodle proctoring. As we said, it's just a camera on your device. You just need to allow the camera the first time you use it. You can capture um, it captures your picture at random times. It doesn't record sound or anything. It's just there to validate who you are. But that's why it's so important that you upload your profile picture. That's actually a requirement from the institution uh, because that is used to verify your identity. So obviously the device that you will be new using will need a camera uh, to take these snapshots. The second one that you might encounter is the Invigilator app. Now this one only works on a cell phone. So uh, what you do is this app runs on your phone, you put it next to you, you type out your exam or your assignment uh, in Word, or you can, in some uh, cases, they also allow you to write it uh, out by hand. I know, for instance, CTA day data, actually, you must use your handwriting, while others you can actually use Word. So this is an app that runs on your phone. You register on it. You will only be able to register on the app if you're actually going to be using this proctoring, else it will give you an error message to say that your email has not been verified by the university. But it generally means you most likely won't be using this simulator app. But closer to the assessments, exams just make sure uh, when they give the exam guidelines or assessment guidelines that you uh, know if they're going to be using this app and then you can always uh, you know if you struggle with this app they have a support dedicated support line for it it's a whatsapp support line so if you're going to be using it save the support uh, number already uh, so that you can access it very quickly now this one <clears throat> it basically runs on your phone. It records audio in the background. It prompts you during the session to take a picture of yourself, of your, your uh, area where you are doing your assessment. It will also ask you to take a picture of identification, such as your ID or student card or your driver's license. Uh, so any of those uh, you can basically uh, use. Now, we will be having sessions specifically on these proctoring tools as we get closer to the exams, but I'll show you now where you can go and test them out already if you're going to be using one of them. So the last one I just want to cover is iris invigilation. So this one only works on a laptop or desktop. It's not for mobile. Um, it is a Chrome extension, so almost like the library extension that you installed earlier. So it works exactly the same. And for this one, you do need a microphone and a camera. You're not allowed to wear headsets uh, for any of the structuring tools. Uh, but for this one, it captures your actual screen that you're working on. So you may only use one monitor. It records the audio uh, and the video uh, during the session. And afterwards, it uploads it to the cloud. So I'm just quickly going to um, show you. If you are interested in the, if you're going to be using some of these tools for your assignments already, if you go to this activity that we've just completed, we've got a link here, the My Exams Guide, Invigilator app, for instance. So this will take you to the Invigilator app. Uh, it tells you exactly how to set it up. And at the bottom, there's also a mock exam that you can do that uses this proctoring tool. So this is the same for, um, the course activity as well. 
where if you're using the Moodle proctoring, you click on this link, it will take you to the uh, my exams guides. And at the bottom, we've also got a link to a mock exam that uses this tool. And it's the same for iris invigilation. So if you will see set and there's some of the assessments where you're going to be using iris, the setup is our, all the guides are on here. And at the bottom, we've got the mock exam as well. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people ask about the My Life email. So these days you use this to sign into um, uh, My Modules as well. So it is a requirement that you know your My Life email address. It's generally just your student number at mylife.unisa.ac.za. And as we mentioned as well, this is a Microsoft account. So when you log in, you will get this Microsoft type of login. So remember to use your My Life email for all correspondence with the university and to check it regularly uh, so that you uh, have all the updated announcements. Now, as we mentioned, your My Life email account is a Microsoft 365 account. So just think of it at the old, uh, previously we always talked about Office. Uh, you know, I want Office, my computer, Word, PowerPoint, all of those. This actually gives you all of those uh, apps already. So you must really think of it as a cloud platform that you can use for productivity for your assignments, all of that. And on that LMS that we shared, there's a lot of courses to help you uh, get started with it. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of apps that you get access to. So there is, you know, power apps to create almost like mobile apps, power automate to create, you know, um, things that happen once uh, something is triggered. So you can automate a lot of things. Uh, but the ones that are really, you know, very important to use, I would say is your Outlook, that's your My Life email, OneDrive, you're still using USBs and all of that when you go uh, to computer labs to uh, work on documents. Rather get in the habit of using OneDrive, your online cloud storage. You can access files from anywhere. You can um, even access it if you travel overseas. You just log into a computer, and your files will be there. Another one would be Teams, that's being used quite a lot now for group work and for a lot of modules uh, as well, especially as you get to the honor stage. Then another app I would really advise you to perhaps have a look at as well as OneNote. It's like an online binder. So if you like taking notes and you, you know, putting it in a binder with uh, divisions, so you can uh, divide it so you can easily get information. It works exactly the same. What's nice about it, it works on your phone, online, on Windows. So you can always just add some notes in and get back to it very quickly. And then obviously the three uh, main productivity tools, Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. So all of them are included. And uh, since it's with Microsoft 365, it's where all the documents are very secure. If you save it online, you can access it from anywhere. You can collaborate on documents. You can share documents. And this is really the tools that you will be using in the workplace one day as well. Uh, most institutions, uh, big institutions are going either Microsoft or Google. Uh, with a lot of enterprises now going specifically for Microsoft. So, but the concepts, doesn't matter which platform your company will use one day, the concepts generally remain the same. So if you learn the one, you can easily adapt to another one. So I would really advise you go have a look at it, sign in, download the apps to your computer, uh, make sure just if you upload or uh, install it on your computer, sign in with your My Life email. That's what uh, gives you the license. So as you might imagine, we if you're going to be using these proctoring tools, these apps, you will need you know a, a smartphone and a computer that can run all of these. So generally, with smartphones, so try not to be older than five years. You know, make sure that it's updated, that you've got space for proctoring apps, you don't have to store uh, information on it if you're going to be using your phone, um, and that it's got a working camera, microphone, and sound. And that's the same with desktops and laptops, you know, preferably Windows 10 or uh, Windows 11 now uh, with the latest updates. Uh, it must have access to the internet, be able to run the productivity apps uh, efficiently, such as Microsoft Office, and then also have a modern web browser uh, such as Google Chrome 
for Microsoft Edge. Now, if you're going to be using proctoring tools, remember that it will need a working camera, microphone, sound, and Wi-Fi. Now, just a uh, quick reminder, I will share this link in the chat as well. So if you uh, want to explore the proctoring tools, you can visit this uh, course is open online as well. But have a look out closer to exams, then we generally have specific workshops just on these proctoring tools to really make you sure that it works on your device and that you are ready for the exams. Then <clears throat> just also lastly, if you are um, if you have any special needs, remember you can get exempted for proctoring, you can get a, a, a additional time during exams but you need to apply for it. So remember to email, if you've got a special needs, email Oxford at unisol.ac.za. There are forms that you need to complete every year uh, uh, and they will assess uh, what your needs are and it's sort of help you out. So for this last session, I'm just gonna hand over back to David that will take you through uh, regional support services. Thanks, David. Thanks, Richard. OK, um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. I was actually trying to answer students' emails. So <laughs> good timing. <laughs> but anyway, let me continue. All right, so students, um, I did see quite a few questions around about um, training and regional services. So yes, so we do have regions all over the country, and you can easily access them on the UNISA portal. All right, and you can see they're broken up into sort of different areas, but we call it a region. For example, the northeastern is Limpopo and Mpumalanga, but we call it the northeastern region. So if you see that and you're living in those provinces, then that's actually where you're located. And also we've got Midlands, which is basically northern, northern Cape, northwest and Free State. So that's then the Midlands, uh, Eastern Cape, KwaZulu-Natal, I think those ones are straightforward in Gauteng as well. So there you can see them. And of course, we've got Ethiopia as well. Now, all these regions have services, guys, like computer labs. Um, there are digital learning advisors in those computer labs who can also assist you with installing, for example, Microsoft 365, um, giving you help and support on uh, training that they have on Microsoft products, on MyUNISA products. So those things should be happening already. So if you're not aware of the training that's happening in your region, just contact your local campus and find out what training is happening there on the ground if you want to have face-to-face -face training. Um, as we said, there is help and support. There are libraries scattered as well in those areas, not all centers, but there are some. And you, of course, you've got tutorial services and things like that as well. So if I have a look, go visit the campus, see what's available, who's available, get their contact details. So it's always good to have that little bubble of people that you know that are close to you if you come across or you get stuck with something or you need assistance. Um, so yes, so that's a very good idea. We've also got digital access centers that you can also see. They're also scattered all around um, the country, but pretty much in the rural areas. So they're sort of like internet cafes that as a UNISA student, you can actually go and access it for free. And there's a login process that you follow with the digital access center. And you can also find that details on the UNISA website as well. So there's a host of resources that are available to you. So please do familiarize yourself with those resources. Now, if you're staying outside of the country and you're working overseas, yes, then of course you can still contact us at Adov and of course with all the online activities like what we're doing tonight. So we're not leaving you out of the picture as well. Digital literacy is very important, guys. And as Richard showed you already, we do have um, the resources available on the Adolf site that can teach you a lot of the skills, um, like the Microsoft 365 course that you can go do. We have posted in the chat. So if you've got the time, go engage those resources because you've got licenses, you can access it. Working online has a lot of advantages, guys. Um, so please do use it. So even if load shedding happens and your device runs out of fuel, it's still OK because if you're working online, it automatically saves your work. So those are the very important things that you need to do. So basic skills, make sure if you don't have those skills, go get those skills. You're going to need it. Typing skills, guys, is so important. You need to learn to type with more than one finger or two fingers. OK, guys, God gave you 10, so try to use all 10. 
Um, so yes, hopefully you got all 10. Um, so yes, get those typing skills. You're going to need to learn how to use it. Take the advantage of the Microsoft 365 course guys that we do have. Uh, because there's so many cool apps there that you can learn and use and it'll definitely enhance what you're trying to learn. And of course, in the work environment, you can find these same tools might even be there one day. So it'll definitely help. Of course, all the 4AR stuff that we do on the ad of site and of course, artificial intelligence, hey, how to use it for the right ways uh, that will be coming up, I'm sure, this year. Then, of course, my UNISA, my modules, my life, what we're covering today, as I said, it is covered by the region. So just check your region, see what activities they're doing specifically for postgrads. Uh, usually there are WhatsApp groups and things like that. So contact your nearest center and get engaged with the colleagues there to see what is happening. Of course, there is social media, as we know, YouTube, guys. Yes, we do have a YouTube channel. Um, here's the QR codes. You can scan it in with your phone. Uh, but it's actually, if you do a quick Google search on YouTube search, you will be able to find us there, the Academic Development Open Virtual Hub. So please do like and subscribe to the channel because whenever we go and upload new videos and resources, um, that's where you will find it as well, apart from our add of platform. And of course, we also have the UNISA Student Support Services uh, channel that you can also join. Uh, where we also have different events from other colleges and support departments across the country and you can also see what's happening there as well so it's definitely useful and of course we will share all this information with you guys so don't panic now when you've got problems or you need support right we do have the student support contact center so here are the details so if you want to just take a quick snap with your phone or a print a screen grab and you can do that. There is an 0800 number that you can call. But there are dedicated mailboxes, which is very important to know. So please don't email all of them with your query. Just select the one that best suits your query. Uh, and then, yep, send it just to the one mailbox. If you send an email to all of these, then most likely it might not even get responded to because everybody's expecting someone else to respond to it. So that's just a rule of thumb. Or the firewall might just block you, think you're trying to spam the, the server. So if it's a data query, yes, if you haven't received your, your data, then just send an email to data queries at UNISA, but please use your My Life email account, okay? Not your personal or business or work emails, because again, those can be blocked by the firewall. If certain words are in it and it thinks you're trying to do something else, then it will block you. So please just take note of that. Any issues with my modules, okay? If your module code is not reflecting or yep, then that's definitely the email address that you can send it to. But hopefully by now everything should be in order, but just in case. And then of course, exam queries, there's also the email address for that. So please do take note of those. Um, it is all on the, the support page. I'll actually show you where it is in a minute. Um, so you can definitely contact them. So before I say thank you, um, let me quickly show you. So when you go to UNISA's platform, right? My UNISA, you'll find inquiries over here. And here's basically the phone book of the institution. So you can see all the different email addresses here. And if you scroll down, you'll see all the colleges, the assessments, assignments, exams. It's all in this location. So if you've got any issues, you can see the colleagues details are there as well. Finance, student funding, it's a common question. Your college, if you're having a problem, there is the college contact details as well. So you can also get hold of your college. And of course, as I did allude to, if you are in the regions and you want to get some contact or help and support, go and check them out. They're all over the country, as I explained, and you can see all the regions have got different contact emails. And yes, there are people working on those mailboxes, so they should respond to you within the 48 hours, I hope. All right, so there we go. So you can see all the contact information is there. There's your student admin. Now, there was a couple of questions about changing cell phone numbers. So if you're in the Western Cape, there is the email address for student admin. But of course, go to the one that's closest to you, and then you can contact the colleagues there, for example, for that issue that we saw. Then, of course, you do have things like, uh, let me quickly zip along here. Uh, that's something else. OK, yes, the add-off site for YouTube. So as I said, please like and subscribe. You might see this little guy. His name is, oh, she, her name is Lawazi. That is our robot. So there's a video. So you, if you want to know more about Lawazi, uh, you can actually go check out this little video where Lawazi is actually speaking to you guys as students to say 
this is who she is and how she's going to help you. So hopefully during the year, you will actually see her in our some of our training events. And yes, so there's lots of videos that you can actually go see here as well. Guys, different events that are taking place, you can really go see what's happening at your university that you enrolled in. But of course, if you like and subscribe, it will make it a lot easier. All right, and that's pretty much from my side. Um, I see we are running out of time. So back to you, Denzel and Richard. Thank you so much, David and Richard, for that presentation. Uh, as you uh, went through it, I'm hoping that the students have seen the different platforms as well as got a better insight in terms of the uh, skills that are needed to navigate some of these platforms. And as David and Richard have alluded to, uh, please look out for us wherever you see the Academic Development Open Virtual Hub, Adove. Remember, we are responsible for student training and specifically for digital competencies, 4IR, etc., which we will be advancing more strategically and doing much, much more of these sessions in the course of the year. So please look out for our announcements and invitations. And when you do get it, please do join us because as you can see, it can really be benefit you a lot. And I must also say that we do some amazing work with some of our strategic partners like uh, Microsoft and RGB Gaming. So look out for those as well, because you might be able to do some of those calls and get a certificate as well from Microsoft if you join those calls. So there's a lot of potential for you in the upcoming year. Uh, and we're already in the uh, fourth month, so look out because you're going to see much, much more of these sessions coming your way. Uh, it's now gone 10 minutes. We do apologize for that. We try as much as possible to keep to our times, and we know it's a Friday session, but I must say thank you to each one of you. We've had close to 450 attendees or so, students joining us on a Friday, and that is very positive for us considering it's a Friday our evening as well. Uh, I want to say thank you to our team, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Milan, Dr. Ingrid in absence, uh, Richard and David. Thank you so much for the excellent presentations. And uh, it was really, really insightful. And then to all our students, we thank you for joining us. We wish you nothing but the best for the year ahead. And uh, we hope that this will be a successful journey for you, an insightful journey for you. And please remember, that we are really here to walk you through the sessions, to provide support to you. And as you are engaging with, please feel free to drop us an email, um, drop us, uh, and you can communicate with us even on our Adobe Learning Management platform. And uh, we will try our best to support you in whatever way we can to get you through the, your studies as well. So from our side, we just want to say good night. Uh, God bless to each one of you. And we will see you in one of our upcoming training sessions. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend as well. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. All the best.